Hello everyone. Welcome to ESGI's Celebrity Webinar Series. Today's topic is, I'm done with centers, now what? I'm Rochelle and I'm excited to be your host for today's webinar featuring the one and only Katie Mincy from Little Warriors. We'll get started with Katie's presentation in just a moment, but first we have a few housekeeping details for you. For better audio and video quality, close other applications like Skype that use your bandwidth. If you are having any audio or video issues, try refreshing or changing browsers. Today we will be using the question feature since everyone is muted during the webinar. If you have any questions, type it in the box. Let's practice now. Everyone find the question box and type in where you're from. It looks like we have people from all over and that's fabulous. We love to see all the new friends that we have with ESGI. Today we have some fabulous prizes for those people who view the webinar live. Five lucky winners will get one year subscription to ESGI. Everyone in attendance though will be getting a prize package from Katie called the Early Finisher Center System. You will also receive for attending live a certificate of attendance. Your certificate will be emailed to you within two days. That email will also contain a link to today's broadcast. We at ESGI are thrilled that so many of you registered to learn with Katie today. Thanks to all of you who are dedicated to helping children and families. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Katie and let the learning begin. Hi guys, um, my name is Katie Mincy and I'm a kindergarten teacher in a district in southern Illinois called West Glen. Um, and when I say Illinois, a lot of times people think of Chicago, but I'm actually um, right across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I've been teaching kindergarten for 13 years now, so my very first kindergarten class are now seniors in high school. Yikes, it's crazy how time flies, isn't it? Um, I'm also the author of a blog called Little Warriors. Um, in case you're wondering where my blog name came from, um, we are the West Glen Warriors, so it's our district mascot, so that's where that came from. Um, I started blogging back in 2012 as a way to share ideas with other teachers out there. Um, little did I know that when I wrote that first blog post, um, where it would lead me. I've gotten to meet so many passionate teachers who love what they do and are excited to learn new things. Um, and I'm super excited to get to spend my time with you tonight. Um, I know you're all super busy, so I just want to take a minute to say thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join me. Um, of course, when I'm not teaching, my most important job is that I'm a wife and a mom to three little boys, so I'm a boy mom. Um, Brody is nine, Gray is seven, and Finn is four years old. And in case you're wondering, no, we're not trying for a girl. <laughs> we get that question all the time, but we are done. Um, and let me just tell you that they are all boy. Um, they love the outdoors, and they love everything slimy and dirty. Um, as you can see um, in the top picture, we're holding fish and frogs and snails. Um, but that's okay with me, because that's exactly how I was when I was little. Um, my neighbors still joke with me that I was that little girl um, knee deep in the creek, just like looking for little creatures. So I'm actually the perfect fit for these little guys, but they definitely keep me busy. Um, so let's do this. Tonight we're going to talk about um, your early finishers at center time. We're going to talk about how to organize um, your early finisher activities, how to manage them, and just different activities that you can do um, and have in place for your early finishers when they get done with their centers. Um, so what is a can-do center? 
Um, those are games or activities that are available for students to choose from when they're finished with their have-to center. So you'll hear me use the terms can-do center and have-to center, and I actually um, kind of stole that terminology from Kim Adsit, and I didn't even realize it at first, but um, I've been watching Kim present for since I started teaching 13 years ago, and I heard, must have heard her say those terms um, a long time ago when I saw her present, and they just kind of stuck with me, and so that's kind of what I've always called them. So the can-do centers are games or activities that students can work on independently with a partner or in a group, and they're in place to help keep students actively engaged during the entire center time. These extra centers should be fun, familiar, and help reinforce skills that students have to master. Um, they may also be activities um, that just help students become productive and cooperative members of a team. Um, so that's very, very important for them to learn in kindergarten as well. And just remember that these can-do centers should be very little prep for the teacher because you guys have enough um, to worry about and to prep for every week. So, all right. So this is just a list of possible can-do centers that you can use in your room, and we'll go through these later, but this is just a quick list. Um, and I just want to remind you that can-do centers have to be familiar activities. Familiar is the key word here. Make sure that you introduce and practice the games and activities that you put in your can-do centers several times during whole group before you put them into your can-do rotation. Okay, that's so important because the whole point of can-do centers is to keep your kids actively engaged so that you can work with your small groups or do your assessments. Um, so if they're not familiar activities, they're not going to know really what to do. So make sure that you introduce those. Um, students must complete their have-to center before they can pick a can-do center. So here's kind of the difference. Um, a have-to center should be a predictable activity that is aligned to your standards. Okay? It should reinforce what you are learning in class. Students work on the have-to centers independently. So this is their own work. They do it by themselves. Um, there is always an end product or response sheet to complete for their have-to centers to help keep them accountable for their work. Um, a can-do center should be a familiar gamer activity um, and they help reinforce skills or help them be productive members of a team. They can work together on these um, or independently or with a partner or group. Um, and there may or may not be a response sheet to complete um, during their can-do center. Okay? Um, so this session is mostly about your early finishers, but I kind of want to give you some background information about my have-to centers so that you can kind of see how it all fits together. Um, so my have-to centers are stored in these bins, and I love these bins. They're nice and sturdy and big, and they're from Big Lots. Um, and you can usually find them like during back-to-school time is when you can find those awesome bins. Um, so in my classroom, we have a four-day center rotation. So by the end of the week, each student will have completed four different center activities. And I know when you look at my chart, you'll see that there's actually eight different centers, so that might be kind of confusing. But I usually have really big class sizes. Sometimes I have up to 27 kindergartners in my class. Um, so this was a way for me to just make smaller groups. So centers one through four are actually exactly the same as centers five through eight. Um, the only difference is I usually put um, my more um, beyond level students in centers five through eight, and my on level and approaching level would be like one through four. So it helps me to be able to differentiate my centers better. Okay, but there's actually just four different centers that they're going to go to um, during that week. Um, my have to centers are the main focus of my center time. This is where the students will reinforce all of the skills that I have taught in class. Can-do can centers, on the other hand, are a privilege. Um, not every student will get to go to a can-do center every day, and that's okay. And at first, um, 
you know, if they don't get to go to a can-do center, you will have kids that get upset, um, but they learn over a couple of weeks, over some time, that that's okay, you know, they've got more time during that week um, to be able to finish early and get to those other centers. Um, here's a little bit more background information about my have-to centers. We have centers twice a day. We have a literacy center block in the morning, and we do our math centers in the afternoon. Okay, so each center time block lasts for about 40 minutes. Um, as you know, students come into kindergarten at very different levels with very different experiences. So some students might take 20 minutes to complete their half to center, while other kids might, may take the whole entire center time to complete their half to center. So for those kids that are finishing early, you have to have activities in place to keep them actively engaged. Okay, um, so here's what my have to centers might look like for the week. This is a math rotation, so there's four different activities. Um, and if you look at center A, um, it's just number sequencing and filling in the missing number. So they would color the spider yellow, and then they would write um, number 10 for the missing number. Okay, um, center B is just two haunted houses. They're counting how many ghosts and then circling the number that is greater. Um, center C is um, writing equations, so they're adding how many Frankensteins and how many skeletons are in the picture. And then center D, they're just counting the different kinds of candy in the bag and writing those numbers on their response sheet. Um, so you can see that my have to centers are pretty predictable. Um, they're all set up the same way. They know that they pick a card, they color it with the matching color on their response sheet, and then they write their answer. So when they get to their um, have to center, there's really no question about what they have to do. Um, the centers are set up this way every week. The skills get a little bit harder, but um, they're very predictable. So the kids know what to do when they get there. Um, so why should you do can-do centers and keep your kids actively engaged for the whole center time? Well, because it lets you be able to um, work with your small groups and do guided reading or um, math interventions, but it also gives you that time to do assessments for your kids. Because I know you know in, when you teach kindergarten, you have a lot of assessments to do at the end of every quarter. Um, so if you look on the left side, this is what testing looked like before ESGI. So, and I just want to say thank you to ESGI for um, sponsoring this webinar today. If you guys have not tried ESGI out yet, you have to try it. It will change your life, for real. It will save you so much time. So on the left side is what assessments used to look like before SGI. It was just tons of papers. And you would go through tons of papers, and you would test them on all these little skills, and you would hand write your colors and your shapes, and you'd do this with every kid. And by the time you got to the next kid, you'd be like, where is that paper that I drew with my colors and shapes on it? And then you'd end up drawing it again, and it would just take forever. Um, but now with ESGI, you guys, it is so quick and so easy to assess your kids. Um, the little black box at the bottom is what the students see when you're assessing them when you're using ESGI. You can pull it up on a phone. You can use your iPad, um, your laptop, any device that you have handy. Um, and some people have the misconception that this is something you have to download or um, install on your computer. It's not. It's a website, and you just log in, and it has it keeps track of everything for you. So the little black box at the bottom is what the kids see, and it just flashes numbers or letters or whatever skill up on the screen, and all you have to do is click yes or no. And it keeps track of what they got right and what they got wrong. Um, Along the side, you can see little um, things that you can click on. One says class totals report. You just click on that, and it shows you totals for your entire class. So it's really easy to pinpoint your struggling students and be able to pinpoint who you might need to refer. Um, you can, with just a click, it'll print out bar graphs for you. My most favorite feature as a teacher um, that ESGI has is all you do is click on test results letters, and it brings up a PDF file of a letter for every single student's parents that says, Dear so-and-so, 
this is what your student knows, this is what they still need to work on. Um, it's amazing. You don't have to think about it. You just click it and send it home, and parents uh, are informed about how their students are doing. Right under that, there's a button for you to click to print out flashcards. Um, it prints them out for each individual student, so it only prints out the things that they still need to work on. Um, you can print out pie charts. There's just so many things you can do with this, and it's just so easy to use. So if you have not checked this out yet, you have to check it out. Um, you can use the promo code that's up at the top. That's my affiliate code. Or it's at the bottom of every slide. If you don't have time to write it down right now, you, you'll see it the whole time. But if you use that code, you can get a 60-day free trial just to try out ESGI. And if you decide that you like it, which I know you will, then you will also get money off of your first year subscription with that code. OK, so moving along for your management system for your can-do centers, or for centers in, in general. A good management system is key. It sets the students up for independence, and that is what you want during center time, is for your kids to be independent, so that you can get what you need to get done, and the kids are actively engaged in meaningful activities. Um, so you'll want to take plenty of time to train your students. That is so important. I don't know if you've ever heard the term, sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. It is so true. If you do not take the time to train your students, then your center time can be a train wreck. <laughs> so I, learned that, I have learned that the hard way. So you want to take all the time that you can to train your students and set firm expectations because you get what you expect. Okay? Um, this, is, I feel like, is a really important tip. Um, have all of your materials easily accessible. If you want to work with your small groups without interruption, um, then you have to have your materials easily accessible for the kids so that they're not coming over telling you that their pencil broke or that they um, are at the dice center and they can't find the dice. Um, if your materials are all labeled and they know where they're at and they know where to get it, they just go over, grab what they need, and get back to work without having to ask you anything or bother you or interrupt your small groups. Um, this is also very important, and I have these anchor charts hanging in my classroom just to help, them, help remind them of our procedures and what they should do if they have a problem. Um, these are also free in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. So this one is, um, how can I solve my problem? Well, number one, if your pencil breaks, um, it just shows them you know what to do. Go get a sharp pencil out of the bucket. If you need um, a pink marker and you don't have a pink marker, they know that they can just go to the drawer and get one out. Um, we also have hand signals in my classroom. I love hand signals. Um, for things like going to the bathroom or getting a drink, and I'll talk more about those in just a second so that you know exactly what I'm talking about there. Um, and then if there's a problem, if someone's not sharing or if they're being mean, they should know what to do. Instead of coming to tell me, they should be able to try to work out their problem on their own and use their words and try to work together to solve it. Um, this is another anchor chart that I have. It's called, um, Do You Have a Question? And this one is actually an idea that I got from my friend Dee Dee from Mrs. Wells Kindergarten. Um, so number one, if you have a question, ask everybody in your group and see if they can help you with that question. Um, number two, we have I can statements at every center. They're just little picture directions. So looking at those sometimes might help them figure out the answer to their question. Um, number three, if you still don't know the answer to your question, looking at the um, center's chart sometimes can be very helpful because they know that center A, for example, is the same center as center E. So if someone in their group doesn't know the answer and can't help them out, they know that the people at center E are working on the exact same thing. So they can go ask them, and they might be able to help them. Now, if you still don't have the answer, then you have to ask at least three more people somewhere around the room. Um, and then, if you've done all of those things and you still cannot figure out an answer to your problem, then you can come and ask me. 
Um, and then down at the bottom, it just shows our hand signals. These are also a freebie in my Teachers Pay Teacher store. They're just nonverbal hand signals that we use. Um, if you have to get a drink or go to the bathroom or something, they know not to come over to my small groups or my guided reading groups and interrupt us. Um, if they have to, they can come over and just hold up a finger and wait for me to see them. And then I'll either shake my head yes or shake my head no. And that means you need to go get some more work done. Um, I love these because they, they don't interrupt our groups. And number two, I love them because it eliminates the chain reaction. <laughs> so if somebody yells, can I go get a drink? Well, then everybody has to go get a drink. So this is just kind of a, a quiet way um, so that other people don't really even notice that they're leaving the room to get a drink or go to the bathroom. <clears throat> OK, so now we're going to get kind of into the management <clears throat> system of our can-do centers. So this is stop. Before you pick a can-do center, you must, so here are the things that they have to do. <clears throat> Number one, when they're done with their have-to center, they have to have a teacher or a grown-up check their paper. Now, it says down at the bottom that I'm often available to check papers during math centers, but during guided reading, I'm with my small groups, and they know that they cannot bother me. Um, I try to get, as much as I can, um, parent volunteers in our classroom. I do work at a Title I school, so that's not always possible. Um, but grandparents are great for volunteering in the classroom. Also, um, every once in a while, I have a mom that's a nurse, so they don't usually work five days a week, so a lot of times they can come in for a day. Um, since we are also a Title I school, sometimes the Title I aides will push in. So a lot of times I will have another adult in the classroom to check my papers, but I don't always, okay? And at the top, you can see that the little girl is picking um, a Cento's marker out of my marker holders, and that's just, just a little incentive for them. They get to pick the smelly marker that they want um, for when they're done with their paper for me to put a star on or for an adult to put a star on, and they, they just love those. Um, Oh, and then this just shows a have-to um, unit that I use, but the arrow is pointing to answer keys. Answer keys are really good to have on hand, so that if you do have um, a parent volunteer in your classroom that's checking papers for you, um, these are good to have so that they can quickly see um, what the answers are and what's expected of the kids to have on their papers. Okay, so after they have their paper checked, then they go ahead and put it in the po their pocket chart. Um, I have this 27 pocket classroom organizer in my room, so everybody has their own pocket. Um, and inside of the pocket, there's just, it's called Rockstar Papers. Um, it's just a little chart so that when they are done with their center, um, and at the end of the day, I go through this pocket chart, and I see if they have their centers, both of their center work done, if it's done neatly, um, and if it's in the pocket chart. And if all those things are done, then they will get a star on their chart. Um, and then when they get five stars on their chart, then they get some kind of little incentive. So they love this. Um, and they, they really do work hard to get those stars. Um, and this also, if there is no other adult in my room, then they can just go ahead and put it in their pocket chart, and then at the end of the day, when I go through these, I'm able to check and see and make sure that they did their work and did it correctly and did it neatly. So even if somebody isn't available to check during center time, I can always check later on if I have to. Um, so then the next thing that they have to do after their paper is put away and checked is that they have to clean up their mess. If they're the last one at the center, they have to put their basket back on the shelf, or otherwise they just have to clean up their area. Um, and another quick little tip, it seems really simple, but it works wonders, is just to have your shelves and things labeled so that the kids know exactly where to put things back. It, it's magical. It <laughs> works wonders. Um, now, this step I only do in the afternoon after our math centers, because it's getting close to pack-up time, and one thing that I just hate is pack-up time, because it turns into chaos so quickly, um, and 
it's just a waste of time. And I, you probably know if you teach kindergarten that pack up time can get crazy. So instead of having pack up time, the last thing that they have to do before they can pick a can do center is go get their things out of their locker, hang them on the back of their chair. And then I used to have um, behavior charts that they would have to color what color they were on. So if you have behavior charts, that is a good time to take care of those so that you're not wasting time at the end of the day doing that. So they can go ahead and color their um, chart and pack all that up in their backpack. And then it is time to pick their candy center. So I just have that little anchor chart um, next to my candy centers just to remind them to stop and make sure they've done all of those things before they can pick their can-do center. So here is what my math can-do center management looks like. Um, this is how I organize my can-do centers. These are my math options for the week. Um, and math can-dos are just labeled with numbers one through six. And I'm really sorry if you're OCD and you see that these numbers are out of order. I didn't notice that when I took the picture and it doesn't really matter for the whole process of choosing a center, but I'm sorry that those are out of order. I didn't even notice that. Um, so the only thing I have to do is change out the pictures um, next to the numbers every week so that whatever choices I have, I just change out those pictures. So here's a close-up over here on the right side. Um, so center three is the survey center. So I just posted the little picture of the survey next to the number three. Um, then this is a tag. On one side of the tag is their picture, and then on the other side of the tag is what we call a menu. And the menu is just the things that they can choose from for their can-do centers. So they will choose what they want to go to, and then they'll cross it off with a dry erase marker on their tag. So if we go back, there's center three. So they're crossing off number three with their dry erase marker. So they would take their tag and they would just hang it on one of those hooks under um, number three. Okay. Um, once they have crossed out that center on their menu for the day, they cannot change their mind and leave that center. Once they cross it off, they have to stay at that center for the remainder of center time. Which brings me to this rule. During centers, there is no roaming around the room. This is just a pet peeve of mine. It drives me crazy because I feel like if you let kids walk around, some of them will do that during the entire time. They will just roam around and just check out what everybody else is doing, and they're not actively engaged in doing anything. So once they pick a center, they have to stay there for the rest of center time. The only people who are allowed to walk around and move around during that time, I mean, they can move around, but to like roam around the room um, are people who are riding the room that, during literacy center time and people who are doing surveys during math center time. Those people will have to walk around to collect their data. Um, so here are some of my students picking their can-do center. Um, as you can see on the chart, um, the can-do centers two, five, and six are already full. They're all filled up with tags. So these girls are going to have to pick one of the ones that are still open. And you can see that one little girl is hanging her tag on center three. Um, so um, the X's are going to stay on their menus for the rest of the week. Um, we only erase the X's on Monday. And this is one thing that I love about the center system is that once they've crossed out number one and they've gone to number one, they can't go there again for the rest of the week. Because you have those kids that will finish in 20 minutes every single day. They're those early finishers, and they will pick, you know, iPads every single day. Um, so this is a way to kind of force them to choose different options every day and let those other kids who finish a little bit later have the opportunity to do so, work on some of those other skills as well. Okay, so you might be saying, so you mean I have to worry about all of those tags? Um, no way. I cannot do it. Anytime there are little chores like this that you just don't seem to have time for or remember to do, I always make that a classroom job. The kids love having these little jobs and responsibilities, and they're great at reminding each other to do these things. 
Um, so one of our classroom jobs is Center Patrol. And one of the duties of Center Patrol is to take down the tags during cleanup time um, every day after centers. So on Mondays, when we pick new helpers, the Center Patrol knows that they will go get the bucket of tags and they erase all of the X's so that the tags are ready for the week. Um, so if you give them a Kleenex and have them try to erase the tags, they have to have some serious muscle and some, some serious fine motor skills to be able to do it. Um, but if you give them a magic, a Mr. Clean magic eraser, those X's will wipe right off. That's just a little tip that I have for you. Um, and the generic ones that you can get at Dollar, Dollar General or whatever, they were just as good as the Mr. Clean ones. But they will take those X's right off so the kids can do that on their own. Um, and here is Literacy Center can-do management. It's set up exactly the same as my math can-dos. Um, they just have letters on them instead of numbers. Okay, so it's set up exactly the same. So it shows some kids crossing off their menus and hanging their tags on the center that they chose. So this is how I store my can-do centers. Okay, this shelf is amazing. It's actually two shelves. And they are from Ikea. I love these shelves. Um, so I, the numbered ones are the math can-dos that match the system that you saw a minute ago. And the ones with the letters are the literacy can-dos. Um, now, all the kids do when they cross off the A on their menu and hang up their tag, then they go get the drawer. It slides right out of that little um, shelf, and they take the drawer wherever they're working in the room. Um, so I, I highly recommend these shelves. I just love them, and they're really easy for the kids to use. Um, okay, so as I stated previously, can-do centers are a privilege. Students do not have to do a can-do center during center time. So if somebody's breaking one of the rules, they will lose that privilege, and they have to go back to their seat and sit quietly, and nobody wants to do that. So it's just another incentive um, to keep busy and do what you're supposed to do at center time because they love the can-do centers because it's all about playing and playing with your friends. So if you're being unkind, if you're tattling just to try to get someone in trouble, if you're yelling, fighting, roaming around the room, any of those things, you lose that privilege and you're done, you're done with that center time for the day. Um, also, not following the can-do rules. You'll always have that little one that tries to sneak over and erase one of the X's from one of the previous days um, so that they can go to their favorite center twice in a row. Um, but the other kids are really good about letting you know when that happens. So it usually isn't too big of a problem. Um, and the kids have to pick a different one every day. Now, even though you tell them a thousand times that they have to stay at that center and stay busy, you always have kids that are like, but I already did that. What else can I do? Um, so I came up with this little, just kind of like a little anchor chart that I stick in with the can-do center. Um, and it just gives them options. If they get their can-do center finished, like they say, then do it again. Okay? They can draw a picture on the back, color pictures on the front, write a sentence, practice your numbers, highlight your sight words. Okay? So... Anything that will keep them actively engaged um, during center time so that you can get done what you need to get done. I also love these little frames from Whimsy Workshop. They're just little clip art frames that you can um, copy on the back of your response sheets for your can-do centers. And they have little skills all the way around the frame. So like the one in the front is fill in the missing letters of the alphabet. So they can work on that skill and then they have a frame so that they can draw a picture in the middle or write a sentence or whatever they want to do in the middle of the frame. So I just think those frames are pretty cool. Um, so a lot of times you go to a conference or you listen to a session and you think you have to do things exactly the same way as the presenter is telling you. That is not true at all. This is just one management system. It's just one idea and it's what works for me. Um, you might take little parts of this, it might give you some ideas, but you have to do what works for you because everybody's different. Now, everybody has, every classroom has different needs. So no, this is just one idea. Do whatever works for you. Um, this 
works great for me. And one reason I love this system so much is choice. You're giving the kids, at least for a little part of the day, you're giving them a choice. Now, little do they know that secretly <laughs> you still have control. Because you don't have control of what CanDo Center they choose or who they get to work with, but it does allow you to ensure that they're not picking the same activity day after day and week after week. Um, so if a student completes their have-to centers every day that week, and then they go to a can-do center, every, different can-do center every day that week, that's eight centers that they're going to that week, working on eight different skills. So that's pretty awesome. Um, why give students a choice? Well, giving students some choice in what and how they learn motivates them to want to learn and complete their task. We know this. When students are given a choice about what happens to them, it's much more preferable than being controlled and told exactly what to do. Just like adults, you don't want to be controlled and told what to teach. It's much more fun if you get some choice in what you teach and how you teach it. Same thing with kids. So that's why I like giving them a little bit of choice. Okay, so now we're going to move on and just kind of talk about things that, activities that you can do for your can-do centers, okay? Um, but one important thing to remember is to establish anchor activities. These activities are going to stay the same all year long, okay? You're just going to switch out the materials every week. So the clip art might change. The skill might get a little bit harder, but it also makes it fun if you switch out like um, the pins or the manipulatives or the reading glasses. It gives it some novelty and kids love novelty. But if you have anchor activities in place, then the kids know exactly what to do every week and you don't have to keep re-explaining it. Okay, so across the top you can see that um, that's right the room and it's kind of set up the same way every single week. It goes from the beginning of the year from colors and Pete the Cat to the end of the year to our baseball unit. It is set up exactly the same though. It just gets a little tougher and we always switch out the materials that they're using. Um, and then on the bottom is pattern blocks. They are set up exactly the same every week. The graphics are changed. The response sheets might get a little bit tougher with the skills that are introduced in class, but it's the same concept, so you don't have to re keep re-explaining yourself. The kids know what to do and can work independently. And that's the whole goal, is to have them be working independently. Um, one activity that I like to do at Can Do Centers is calendar sheets. The kids love these, and they cover a crazy amount of math concepts on these calendar sheets. I love this little unit. You can get it from Growing Kinders. It's called It's Calendar Time. Now when we have a couple extra minutes in our math block, I'll usually, usually project one of these up on the board and we go through it together and we work on our skills. But then they're in the can-do centers so the kids know exactly what to do and they love these because they get to like play teacher. Um, so they kind of act like me when they're going through the calendar. Um, and these are awesome because they start out so simple in August and then every month it adds a new skill and by the end of the year pretty much every math skill that you can think of are on these calendar pages. So I love this as a can-do center. Um, Dice is always a great easy can-do center. Um, there's tons of math of um, dice games out there for math and sometimes you're lucky enough to come across a literacy dice game too. Um, there's always like roll a snowman, roll a jack-o'-lantern, roll, roll a bear, roll whatever. Um, then you can roll two dice and do greater than less than equal to. You can play against each other to see who fills up their paper first. Um, I have lots of dice games in my store, but I'm going to give you a tip. If you Google free dice printables, you can usually find a whole lot of them out there for free. Um, so. Don't hesitate to try to do that, to collect things for your can-dos. Um, and again, just switching out the manipulatives makes it so fun for the kids. They love novelty. So if you just switch the dice out, 
it's like a whole new center. Um, those little heart dice I found in the um, dollar spot, the Target dollar spot a couple of years ago. There's number dice, there's, there's number word dice, there's dice in dice. I love those little poppers, like the trouble game. Lakeshore used to have those. I'm not sure that they sell them anymore, but if you're lucky, maybe you'll find them on eBay or something. But switching out the dice does magical things. Um, Bingo Dubbers is a fun one to put out. Um, you're working on the same skills, same exact skills, but it's so much more fun because they get to use Bingo Dubbers now. There's a lot of these out there. Um, Little Minds at Work has some good Bingo Dubber games, The Printable Princess, um, and you can find free ones if you Google too. Um, I also like for math to put out just a really simple game. Every time I go to a thrift store or a yard sale, I'm on the lookout for games that match my themes. I'm kind of crazy about how things have to match my themes. So if you find easy games that you don't really need to explain, kids love them. Like, don't break the ice. They just take turns knocking out the ice. They can do that on their own. Um, number bingo, we do that for the 100th day. Um, and then at the bottom is Mr. Mouth, the frog spins around and they try to flick the flies into his mouth. So these are good for um, letting kids play and learn how to work together and take turns. Even fine motor skills for a lot of these games come into play. And we just don't do it, that enough in kindergarten anymore. We're so academically based that you have to have um, time for these kids to play and learn how to play with each other and take turns. Um, cards is a good one. There's lots of different card games out there. Um, there's um, a lot of CVC card games. Um, my kids love the um, card game Trash. It's a math game, and it's number sequencing, but there's a million different math skills that they can work on when they're playing Trash. So they love that game. Um, surveys is a fun one for them to do. Um, it's an anchor activity. We pretty much have surveys every week. Um, it just kind of changes, um, gets a little bit harder every week with the skills that we're working on. Um, so for every theme, I have a survey. Um, and the kids just walk around and collect their data, and then they do their graphs and answer questions. Um, I do have a survey pack in my store, and it has just about every theme that you can think of that you might cover throughout the year. And it starts out really simple, and it just builds on um, the math skills and the graphing skills. Puzzles are a great thing to have for candy centers, and it's super easy. No prep for you. Um, again, yard sales and thrift stores is where I find all my floor puzzles. And they're so great for kids to work together, to problem solve. Um, I just love watching them do puzzles, and they're so proud of themselves when they get one completed, and they always make me take their picture with their finished puzzle. Um, this is a writing station, and this is another one I have out. It's an anchor activity for us that we do every single week. Um, these writing stations are amazing. They are from Dee Dee Wills, from Mrs. Wills Kindergarten. She has one for every single month, and they're all set up the same. Um, it just switches out the graphics, um, and they're seasonal for every month. So the kids know exactly what to do, and they love going here. They can write letters, they can write stories, they can label, and all of these response sheets are included in Dee Dee's Writer's Workstations. I absolutely love these. Um, let's see. This is Write the Room. So this is a good one to have for your literacy um, stations. Um, and you saw that earlier. It's an anchor activity for us. We do this one pretty much every week. We just switch out the glasses and the pointers to make it more fun. Um, and you can find all kinds of different pens and pointers and glasses at the Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree and the Dollar Spot at Target are my go-to places. If you look up in the left corner, those laser pins are at Dollar Tree. They are pins and they are laser pointers. So that's all they need to go around and point and write the room. I love these things. Now this is something you're definitely going to have to talk about before you put them in the center. So that's shining them in each other's eyes and things like that. But the kids love those. Um, pattern Blacks is another one of our anchor activities. This is a math station. We switch out the puzzles every week to match our theme. And then there's all kinds of different um, response sheets that go along with these. 
Um, and the cool thing about these pattern black units that I have is that there's differentiation built right in. Um, some of the puzzles have the blocks that they're going to use to build it. Some of them are open, so it's fun to watch them discover that there's lots of different ways to make these shapes. And then the last one is just to build their own. And they kind of like that one, just to kind of build it however they want to. Um, I have a reading tent in my classroom. It's just a fun place for the kids to go and read. But if you don't have a reading tent, you could always just do read to self, or if you have book boxes, that's a good thing to have out for your literacy can-dos. Um, I love to have out weekly readers. I have always, in my 13 years, for some reason, even before I started doing centers, I've always kept the giant um, teacher versions of the weekly readers in the Scholastic News, um, and I've always laminated them, and I'm so glad I did, because now I pull those out for a literacy station, and I have one that pretty much goes with every theme, and then the kids, a lot of, most of the time, these, um, these are pretty on level for their reading. And even if they're not, they can kind of read the pictures and tell what's going on in these weekly readers. So um, they just fill out a response sheet to tell um, what their weekly reader was about and what they learned. And even in October, you can see at the bottom, obviously we're not reading real well. And this is kind of a harder scholastic news down at the bottom. But they read the pictures, and I love how they have their little pumpkin sequence um, life cycle um, on their response sheet. So these are really cool to have out for your theme. Now, I wanted to throw this in here in the middle. I'm going to throw a lot of um, can-do centers at you. I'm not sure we're going to have time to get through them all. But someone had asked, how do I store my centers? Um, I just get these little containers from, you can get them at Dollar General. They have them at Target. And they're perfect. Um, I just label the front, and those labels have been free in my shoe page store for years. Um, so I just hot glued those to the front of the bins. And then everything I need for that unit is inside of this box. I have it separated into little baggies so it's easy to pull out and just throw in my centers. Um, but all of the can do's that go with that theme and all of the have to's that go with that theme are bagged up and in those little containers. So for that week, I just pull out that container, and I can just throw everything where it needs to go for that week. So that is how I store them. Um, this is word work, and the kids are using the letters in the word Happy New Year to um, create words. So this little guy, this is January, and he um, made the word ha, <laughs> which is awesome. I'll take it. Um, the girl up in the right corner made the word day. Obviously, there's no D in the words happy in the word Happy New Year, um, but she just used a P and flipped it upside down. So that's pretty smart. Uh, I'll take that. Um, these are predictable sentences. So this is our pocket chart center. It is another anchor activity that we do. Um, the kids are just building simple sentences. These are also from Mrs. Lills. As you can see, I love her stuff. It's always super easy. She's always got one for every month. So it's it makes a great anchor activity. Um, I love those little magnetic pocket charts. You can get them from learning resources. And as you can see, they're just fun little predictable sentences, like where is the, and then they can take one of those picture cards to fill in the blank. And then they write their sentence and draw a picture to match. So that's just a fun little pocket chart activity. If you have an overhead laying around from 20 years ago, <laughs> then Dee Dee has created an overhead station also. And this is great for the beginning of the year. Um, the for, for the first quarter one that she has, it's just tracing um, letters and the, the, practicing letter formation. The kids love it because they're using dry erase markers and they're working on the whiteboard. So that's fun. Um, I love doing kitchen. Kids do not get enough time to play, sadly enough, in kindergarten because we're fo so focused on academics now. Um, but if your administrators don't really, um, aren't really big fans of playing and just having your kids play, you can make it into an academic center. Um, as you can see in the picture above, this is not my picture. I, I took it from my friend um, Jessica from Under the Alphabet Tree. She has everything labeled in her kitchen area. So you can put little response sheets in there if you want. They can make recipes. They can make shopping lists. Um, they can do all kinds of things in the kitchen. Um, during Christmas, in our gingerbread unit, we made cookies. Um, you can make cookies and do patterning with them. 
Um, so all kinds of things you can do in the kitchen play area. Listening center is another good one for literacy, and then they just fill out a response sheet to hold them accountable, make sure they listen to the story. Um, sensory table is a fun one. Um, again, I work at a Title I school, and when I brought this in, I'll never forget, this little boy was like, I've never played in a sandbox before. It just kind of like broke my heart, and I was so happy that I brought this in. My classroom is very small, and sensory tables are very big. Um, so you can go online and find um, do-it-yourself sensory tables, and it's just made out of PVC pipe and a Sterilite container, and it's perfect. It's perfect for a um, smaller size sensory table. And in this one, you just fill it with whatever matches your theme. Um, I have little hearts from the Dollar Tree and just some pink um, grass. And we just did this one last week. And they just match the base 10 blocks to the number. So that's what they're doing at that sensory table. <clears throat> stamps are always a good one to pull out. And it's just fun because they don't get to use stamps very often. Um, this is a fluency center. So it's a time me center, and they just they love it because it's a race, and they try to see how fast they can read their um, sight words or go through their letters or their sounds and see how fast they can do that. And it's also fun because they get to use the timer. Of course, you have to train them how to use the timer before you throw it in there, but I would recommend um, buying the uh, primary timers. It just has like two buttons on it, a green button and a red button. So it's super simple for them to use. Um, obviously, Play-Doh is always a hit with kids, and again, it, it, it gets them playing and playing together, but you can also make it academic. Um, Lakeshore has those amazing letter stamps. I just love those things so much because they're so easy for the kids to handle with that big, long handle on the end. So at the beginning of the year, they can practice stamping each other's names um, later on in the year. Here you can see at the bottom they're making CVC words. So lots of things you can do with Play-Doh. Um, these are those little soft pocket dice that you can get from Learning Resources or Lakeshore. And you just slide the little cards into them. Um, and it's just another fun way to practice skills. Um, and this one's from the beginning of the year. They're rolling sight words, they're rolling letters, they're rolling numbers, and it's really just practicing sight word recognition and letter formation. And again, Dee Dee has awesome ones in her store for everything you could possibly think of. Um, this is a super fun one that the kids love. It's lift the flap. And it, it can be, you can do it for math, you can do it for literacy, you can do it for pretty much any skill you want to work on. But they think it's so much fun because they get to lift the flap and find the answer. Um, the one that you see in the picture is a nocturnal animals one. Um, that I put at literacy centers, and they have to predict if they think the animal is nocturnal or not, and then they lift the flap to find out what the answer really was. Again, use what you have in your classroom. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. If you've been teaching as long as I have, then you have plenty of file folder games <laughs> back from the mailbox days um, that you have that you worked so hard on making, and they're just laying around. You can pull those out for a can-do center. The kids love them because they're something different. Um, so don't be afraid to pull things like that out. They're already made. Just pull them out. Tablets, iPad, whatever you have. Kids obviously love to go to that center. So there's all kinds of awesome apps. Um, these are leapfrog games you can find pretty much at any kid's yard sale that has kids stuff. They always have these leap pad games at leapfrog games at yard sales. I find them like crazy. Um, and the word whammer is just an awesome little game to build CVC words and all kinds of skills. Leapfrog is awesome. Okay, so those were just a few ideas that you can use for your can-do centers. Use whatever you have. Um, make it an anchor activity. Introduce it before you put it in there. Those are the most important things to remember. Um, someone else had asked about cleanup time, and I thought that was a really good point. Like, a lot of these can-do centers have a lot of pieces, like puzzles. I mean, it, it, there's just a ton of pieces, and they take a while to clean up. But a good tip it's for cleanup time is to play a fun or educational two- to three-minute song and train the kids so that they know when that song is over, it's kind of like a race to them. 
when that song is over, they have to have everything cleaned up and be sitting back at quietly at their seats. It solves the problem. It gives them a time limit, and they know when that song is over that they have to have everything cleaned up. Um, some of my favorite YouTube channels are um, Jack Hartman has awesome, awesome learning songs. The Learning Station's a good one. Harry Kinnern is awesome. Or if you want to gain some points and go noodle, then you can just go ahead and play a go noodle song. But I like to turn the projector and the screen off so that they're not dancing instead of cleaning up. Um, okay, so we're at the end. So you might be thinking, do I really have to switch all of these activities out every week? No, you don't. Don't make yourself crazy. Remember at the beginning when I said Can Do Center should be little work for the teacher. Many of these centers that I have stay up for the entire month, and some never change at all. Okay, so if you look at the bottom, there's a sample week. Listening center is at one of our anchor activities. All you have to do is switch out the CD or, um, you know, on your bring a different one up, scan a QR code on your tablet. That, that's all you have to change out. The response sheet, every once in a while, you can make the skill a little bit more difficult. Um, writing table. Remember, DD's units, they stay up for the entire month. Reading tent is always there, okay? So don't stress yourself out. This should be an easy thing for you to prepare. And people aren't sure how to start out centers. For the first week, just let them play with the manipulatives. Let them play with the materials. Get them used to how to play it with them. Train them how to use them. Train them how to pick them up and put them away and how to take care of them. You've got to take that time to train them so that um, your center time runs more smoothly. And start simple, okay? Simple ones that the kids have no trouble doing independently. At the beginning of the year, pull out Play-Doh and just let them play, okay? Listening center, all they have to do is sit and listen to a story. That's not hard. Um, kitchen play, magna doodles, and practice their letters. So start simple. Okay? So that is the end. We have come to the end. Um, remember, you will be getting this math and literacy early finisher system for free if you attended live. If you did not attend live, then it is available in my um, Teachers Pay Teacher store. And I also want to give a big thank you to ESGI for sponsoring this webinar tonight. So thank you guys so much. Love ESGI. And don't forget, you can use that promo code down at the bottom um, to get your 60-day free trial and check it out for yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie, for that great information. There were so many uh, comments in the chat, which you'll get to see later. And everybody loved all of your ideas. Thank you so much for your attendance today, and I know all of you are eagerly awaiting the prizes. So the ESGI one-year licenses, you did not need to register. We took them right from the registrants, randomly chosen. You will receive an email from us, so be looking for an email. The winners are Marcy Grutz or Grutch, Mim Blake, Marsha Fodian, Olivia Flores, and Robert Winters. Marcy G, Mim B, Marsha F, Olivia F, and Robert W. You will be receiving emails from us. Look for your email in your inbox. Don't forget that you will receive the Certificate of Participation, a link to the recording of this webinar and Katie's Early Finisher Center system in your inbox. And if you missed any of our celebrity webinars from the past, you can always find them on ESGI's YouTube channel. Thanks again to Katie for presenting the great information. And don't forget to follow Katie at Little Warriors, where she'll be answering uh, the questions that you asked today. Thank you so much and have a great evening.